they had seen it too often. A few people come to the villages, enjoy the jungle, go home and never come back. We found ourselves standing in a room of a house that we would actually end up purchasing with Roque, Pancho, and Lucho, the three most predominant leaders of the Shawi at that time in 1998. And as we stood in this circle holding hands, we were understanding each other in our own language, Shawi, Spanish, English. And I remember as I said to them, we will come back. We will allow God to use us to build his church here in the jungle. After that meeting, I knew this was our mission. We were going to come back. We had to come back. I remember when he first started talking about missions, a pastor from Africa had invited him to come and he assembled the team from grace of all of these people who thought this was a super exciting opportunity to go share God's word. And of course it would be. Uh, he named it GATE, the Gospel Ambassador International Team, if I remember right, is what it stood for. And they began planning this trip. And I don't remember exactly what happened that stopped the trip, but I do remember a feeling of unease, like I really see the purpose, I'm behind the mission. I obviously believe Africa needs God's word as any other country, but I just had an unease with it. Something happened and they weren't able to go. And a short time later, Rick met with uh, another pastor who had raised his family. He grew up in, in a missionary home in a tribe in the jungle and raised his kids there as well. And that's Paul Johnson. He invited us to go to Peru. Well, um, Jim came home from a church meeting one day and he said, babe, we have a new ministry that we're going to be doing. And I said, oh, how exciting. And he said, yeah, I'm going to Peru. I said, what? He said, yeah, me and Rick and Dan are going to Peru. And we are just so excited to start a ministry down there. And I said, well, what have we gone, a week or two? He said, no, we're gonna be gone for a month. And I said, a, a month? <laughs> he said, yeah, but he said, it'll be fine. And then I found out he couldn't call me or, you know, I really couldn't communicate with him. And so I just prayed continually for the whole month of January. <laughs> so Rick and Jim and Dan went off on their first adventure to Peru. 
And I do remember feeling it's still far away. I still have two tiny kids. It's still he'll be out of contact. Uh, I will admit the, the fear of the unknown uh, is always worse than what you do know. You, you assume things are bigger, scarier, more dangerous. Uh, and if you listen to Rick talk, they are bigger, scarier, more dangerous. So uh, watching all Natural Geographic and you know the plants that eat people, the bugs that eat people, the things that get you in the night, um, I was worrisome. So I think to put myself at ease, the kids and I would go to the library and check out everything we could possibly find on Peru and that part of the country. And we'd show pictures and then uh, we had made a kind of an agreement before Rick left that every night at a certain time we were both going to look up and see wherever we could find the stars at night. And that gave the kids peace going outside knowing that their dad could also see the stars. And we read the books, we learned about Peru. It was really, really exciting and a funny thing, Rick came home and we knew more about all of the things that were there than he did because he didn't see a lot of those things where he was at. Um, but it, it was it was stressful, but it was also a time of God proving to me that he's in control, even in situations that I think are outside of my comfort zone. God can take care of it all, and he did. He came home well and healthy and super charged and excited about a brand new group of people and friends for us to love on. When, um, when Jim got home, we had hours of conversation and it was so excited. I had, I had not seen him for years be so excited about something. And they were really dedicated. That one month they were able to meet so many people and talk with the Shawi people and make friends. And then that's when they decided that, that we were gonna pray about it and we were gonna continue to get this ministry to grow. If I could make it mandatory for every Christian to go on a mission trip somewhere out of the country, preferably third world, I would. Because 99% of the time, when I take people to the Amazon, every single one comes back and says, that was the greatest experience of my life. I think the, the picture seeing the from my dad's trips before, uh, looking at pictures and whatnot, it just didn't do it justice. Um, you, you'd see the pictures of the anacondas, um, the wildlife, the people, um, but when that plane lands in the middle of the jungle, it's just a, it's a whole nother world. And, and when that you watch that plane take off and you know that you're kind of, you're there to stay, um, that reality is, is uh, far more than I ever expected it to, to be. I really didn't know what to expect, to be honest with you. Um, you know, I had talked with my brother, and so I knew conditions in the jungle were obviously not what they are here. Um, but I didn't really have any expectations. I was just excited to go and be able to serve and um, really just be part of a team. I really had n no idea um what the ministry was like there. I had visions of it. Um, I worked with Pastor Rick while he was writing his book where he uh, talked about the trip that he took with his boys from faith and I was actually afraid to go. I was afraid of uh, the unknown, mostly. I'm not afraid of bugs and those kinds of things, a little afraid of illness, but I just was the uncertainty of being so far away from my family and really not knowing what was going on there. and. I never really had a passion to go there, and I never thought I would go there. I remember when I was a kid and my dad, he went to the Amazon a ton, and so um, he would always buy these Amazon books for us to read, and we would look through and look at the Amazon River and all the wildlife there, and you know, you always learn about the crazy things, the anaconda and the jaguar, and. Um, I would just get so excited to hear when my dad got home, like, what did you see? What did you eat? Um, and I do have a crazy dad. So usually I did hear something crazy when he got home and it was just, it was so fun. And then just thinking about, I can't wait for when I can get there one day. You know, I committed to the trip and you know, you're in the process of trying to raise money and figure out how the financial piece is gonna fit together. and. Um, things have just been crazy with work and 
Really, I was just looking for any excuse to get out of my commitment. <laughs> and so I woke up one morning and I was literally reaching for my phone about to text uh, Pastor Rick and I get a text message that comes in from him and it's, hey brother, so excited that you're still gonna be coming to Peru with me. Several people have backed out. We're gonna need you now more than ever. And uh, so at that point I was like, well, okay God, you uh, clearly have, uh, have me in your plans for this trip. And, and so uh, we of course made it work. So after the very first time that the guys went and they finally came home, um, they went on trips. Um, just about yearly for a little bit. And then about, I think it was close to five years later is when Jim got thyroid cancer. So he didn't go on trips for um, two or three years. And then it came with um, needing some building projects and him being a custom home builder, it, he was very excited about it. So then he continued to go uh, maybe every year, every two years. And every time he would go, he would always ask me if I wanted to go. And I said, are you out of your mind? There's bugs down there. And so we would joke and laugh about it and I would just do a lot of prayer. So it was 2018, we found out that Jim's uh, cancer had gone metastatic. And he thanked the Lord, he had all those years where he had cancer and it never really affected his life. Once it went metastatic, then he started to have um, different types of trials that he did, things that he did. Well, in 2019, he said, sweetheart, I haven't been able to go for about three or four years. And he said, I really, really want to go. So he said, what are you going to do while I'm gone? I said, oh, I'm going with you. So he got this big smile on his face and he was really excited. He said, well, why are you doing that? I said, honey, you just got off a trial. I need to be there to help you. He said, what are you going to do? I said, well, I'll cook. So I filled my suitcase full of all kinds of stuff I wanted to cook for them that I thought they would like. I think I had more food than I had clothes. <laughs> So Uramaguas is this kind of hustle and bustle slice of Peruvian South Americana. It's unbelievable. And it sits in a location just on the other side of the jungle foothills in such a central location because the only way in and out of the Amazon River at that point in Peru is right there. Uh, all export and import happens, which means with the 68,000 people that now live there, and the vast improvements that have been made in 22 years, it is the best place for us to set up home base for the Shawi. When we started working there in 1998, uh, they were sadly being mistreated by many of the, the mestizos, the half Peruvian, half indigenous people that live in Uramagos. And I don't want to say terrible things about that them because that was just a few and they were ruining it for everyone. Today, the Shawi can walk down the streets of Uramaguas and feel accepted and feel welcome and feel loved. And now we own a house uh, since 1999 that has about three to five acres, a nice property. Uh, thanks to Rick and Susie Glandon, it's in extraordinary shape. And now with Doug and Blanca uh, officing out of the house and utilizing it, it is the place where we have uh, the opportunity to establish a teaching center, a hostel of our own, and really not only provide all the Christian education we can for the Shawi as they travel down river, but a place to house people from grace when they go to do work. We've done multiple projects there. That house represents the very catalyst, at least as far as a property is concerned, for all the work that goes on in the three central locations of the Shawi, up in what we call the Loreto jungle. And they have the Pananapora and the Maranon River that they are able to travel, which comes down right in front of our house. Literally, you can throw a rock into the river. So God provided the perfect place for us to establish home base. So I've been a, a firm believer that the best way to care for children living uh, below the poverty line around the world who don't have health care, who don't have, uh, who do not have clean water and, and most of them don't have a family unit other than maybe one parent 
and they're living in poverty, I've found the best way to do that is partnering with Compassion International. And we had prayed and hoped for decades that Compassion would go into the jungle so that we could sponsor children from the jungle. But then we found out that after all these years of praying, they were moving into Uramaguas and that um, they were going to have 400 children that needed sponsor. A sponsorship with Compassion International is as simple as a full sponsorship, about $45 a month, and you can literally care for the needs of a child spiritually, emotionally, and physically. I love Compassion because they take the gospel. We had been told that Compassion was going to provide a little meeting that we could go to and hear about Compassion's partnership. We got to that church and it was like they'd established the party, the celebration. The trip to Compassion International in that church was heart gripping, wrenching, joyful, all of those emotions. Their welcome party was just very humbling that they would seek to have us there and welcome us like that with their little resources they shared with us. And then to see these children and their families so excited. They had basically prepared a big party for us. I mean, as soon as we got there, um, I believe they just gave us a standing ovation as if, you know, just to thank us, which, you know, it's obviously very humbling, but it was, it was just joy. Just a lot of joy is what I remember from that. Like when I close my eyes and go All of those children that were there, plus a, a 300 more, would become available for sponsorship through Compassion. And so we started that. I challenged the church to sponsor all 400 children. We sponsored almost every single one of those 400 children. And then this year when we went back, I remember us going to the church and seeing, I don't know, probably 50 or more of our children there. And we got to meet them and play with them and listen to them and encourage them and love them. This last summer, I wasn't, we weren't able to go on the trip this year, but Pastor Jim and Pastor Judy um, took a gift from our family down to our Compassion uh, girl, Jennifer, and it was, I was able to call and FaceTime with her and meet her and her mom. And I was just so moved to see how much she appreciated what we did, which seems so little compared to what we have here. It was just so exciting for um, Leanne to be able to see her child's face in person over the phone. We really had an absolutely amazing time and it made me know the importance of having my own compassion child. My compassion child is not in Unimaguas, but is close. So it, um, I hope one of these days if I get to go again, maybe I'll get to see her. Just to like get to meet them in person after writing letters back and forth was the most incredible thing. It was so heartwarming to see the smiles on their faces, to meet their families who, you know, you realize that you're not only sponsoring them, you're sponsoring their entire family. And I make sure that I never forget to write those kids letters now, knowing that they are real human beings with real life problems. And um, the little that I can do month to month makes their life an entire, makes a huge difference in their lives. And so it, it's incredible. Like when I close my eyes and don't even care if anyone sees me dancing. Like I can't fly and I don't even think I'm touching the ground. Yeah. Like a heartbeat skip, like an open page, like a one-way trip on a narrow plane. It's the way that I feel when I'm Those children were giving us gifts. They were loving us, and we felt privileged to love them. So this partnership with Compassion is a gift, and 
You know, I will constantly say, if you've never sponsored a child with Compassion International, do it. And if you're a part of Grace, get a child from Uramaguas. It, it is an amazing, tangible transformation that takes place in their life. The very first time I flew over the jungle in a Cessna with Craig, uh, who has literally been our pilot and friend for 22 years, it was just so nice to get on a plane. You're a little bit nervous. I mean, I'm not gonna lie. I, I've flown all over in commercial planes and a little bit smaller commuter planes, but I've never flown in a Cessna. So uh, we work with Sam Air, which is the aviation branch of South America Mission. Our headquarters are uh, in the Charlotte area, and uh, we've been in Peru for over, I think it's been 75 plus years in Peru. The aviation program has been about 55 years serving in the jungles of Peru. And our purpose and our vision for being there is to facilitate uh, transportation uh, into tribal areas, into remote areas of Peru so that missionaries can get into some of these remote areas. Travel is really difficult uh, by surface. Uh, by surface I mean by boat mainly because there aren't any roads in the jungle and uh, the airplane it really gives access to some really remote areas. And you just look down and you see this this carpet of trees looks like broccoli with the chocolate river running through it because the muddy Amazon and it, every now and then you see a little fire burning couple house huts and then you go a little further and there's a village. Oh the Cessna was awesome. I hate flying. <laughs> but uh, I don't like I don't like to travel or fly at all but the Cessna for whatever reason it's just it's one of the coolest things that you can ever do. You know you're flying not not too high, not too fast, but you're above the tree line and you're able to just see you're just able to see the whole country. I loved it. It was absolutely incredible. Oh my goodness. I am an outdoors lover. I am fascinated by nature and beauty, and I can't take enough pictures. I'll take pictures of the same tree several days in a row just because it's so breathtaking. When I saw the Amazon, I was amazed again at God's creativity and just the beauty, the vast, overwhelming beauty. It looks different than my world here, but just so colorful, so incredible. going there in love with the jungle and leaving there in love with the people. I'd always wanted to be in the Amazon, but all that takes a huge backseat to the Shawi people and our partners, our friends, who have no doubt taught us far more than we have ever taught them. The moment you land in the plane, it's a hundred and whatever degrees and hundred percent humidity. Before you can even get to the back of the plane or the the well of the plane they're carrying your bags they're taking you to your spot this year they built us a hut to put our tents in and little did we know we were going to be in an 8.3 earthquake and that hut actually give us gave us some stability that's the kind of generosity of the Shawi people it's far different from our way of life so it's hard to understand how how are these people like me that they can live there and actually exist and thrive uh, because later I, th I learned they were thriving. First I thought they were, this is sad that they live this way, but when I met them, 
I couldn't have been more wrong. They love that life. They enjoy their village. It's what they know. They love their family. They take care of their children. They have their marriages. Different? Yes, very different. But I think that first lesson I learned is they're so much like me. They're God's creation. They have minds and, and thoughts and feelings and ambitions and goals just the same way we do. And God's love, um, their eagerness to see God and His Word and understand His love was the thing that stood out to me the most. Uh, you have the language barrier. Um, you have the cultural barrier. We didn't know if we'd ever really make the deep connections. Oh man, I mean, you don't even have to know the language. Y your hearts just connect. And if you're just honest and real, and, and if you listen and watch and observe, they will be a life-changing people group. So in 2001, um, my dad was coaching uh, the varsity basketball team at Faith Christian. I was going into my freshman year of high school, and he told me that uh, him and the coaches had decided that they were going to take the team to the Amazon to build a church. We went into the village of Soledad. This was back when, I mean, the moment the plane dropped you off, you were completely removed from civilization. The church building they had was thatch roof, uh, tin walls, and it was falling apart. You know, I, people that know me know that I don't have a, a I'm not a handyman, so to speak. So this was a, this was kind of my first experience of, of building anything to this this magnitude. And in the middle of the jungle, when you don't have the resources that we have here, it was difficult. These guys worked so hard. I, I was a lot younger back then, and so I worked extremely hard. We laid 2,800 square feet of concrete. Uh, pillars had been poured by a team before with Viet Steiger and some other guys. Uh, we. We built the walls, we put the trusses up, we had to carry the wood, big mahogany 35 foot planks from the jungle 30 minutes. We had a bunch of big basketball junior seniors in high school. Uh, we thought we were all tough and, and you have these, these small uh, Indian people and it, what takes us three people to carry out of the jungle um, I remember looking behind me, there's three of us carrying this big, I think, I don't know, 30 foot truss uh, of wood and it takes three of us and I look behind and, and there's two small Indians carrying the same size piece of wood and we were struggling with three of us and they made it look like nothing. And it was so cool getting to experience this with my son. Uh, he was the first one of my family to travel to the jungle with me. And there are so many memories I couldn't even begin to share them. I have a book called Only Imagine that, that actually tells this story. But, but I watched Jordan bond with these guys. I watched each of these young men grow up. I remember a young man by the name of John Sanders was going to have his 18th birthday on August 12th, which happened to be the day we finished and dedicated the building. And we would have church the day after. And um, I just remember John being so excited that that we finished the project on his birthday. Everybody was thrilled. Fast forward eight years later, the next time I took uh, all of my family to the Amazon and my son Jordan and I, uh, in a very kind of sketchy situation, had to walk a team out of the jungle uh, from one village, San Antonio, to Soledad, about a five, five and a half hour walk, cross the river four or five times, walk through the jungle. And we got to Soledad. And I said, son, you haven't seen the church. I haven't seen the church in Soledad since 01 because I've been going to Maranatha and San Antonio and Palmichi and all these other villages. I go, let's go get a picture. So we went and we stood in front of the church building and we took a picture. And it's still a very precious uh, memory for me because that was the building I built when my son was 14 years old. And I was standing there with him, you know, at 22, 23 years of age and that building was being used every day for the gospel.
it's amazing what it's become and the uses that they have uh, you know, gotten out of it and just the sense of community that, that just that one simple structure that as a high school kid I, I couldn't see the value of fully. Now looking back, it's, it's really amazing what that's brought to them. What does it mean for a community uh, in the jungle, a community of now 1,400 people to have a, a church? Everything, it becomes a central location. And even those who are not believers know where the church is at. Even those who don't know Jesus as their savior know where they can go. That building is Nueva Vida. It's new life for them. And that church, it is another building that serves as a catalyst for transformation. In 1996, the end of 96, when I met Paul Johnson, he mentioned the importance of one church basically adopting one people group and really focusing our attention on what we ended up calling uh, our mission approach, church to church missions. We said, what if we sent missionaries who were full-time staff members and they didn't have to spend any of their time raising funds? The average missionary spends a minimum of 50% of their time on the mission field raising money. That's a, that's a waste of a great missionary. So we took the approach, we're going to put all of our effort into that. We started having this conversation with two extraordinary people here at Grace. Rick and Susie Glandon, who were getting married, they were about to get married, and uh, they said, we're passionate about going to the Amazon. I have always had a desire to do cross-cultural missions, even as a little girl, that has always been a desire for, for me. Um, and after I became saved, it was, it was even a stronger desire. I really understood why um, the importance of going um, into the mission field and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, God had already been laying on my heart about missions. And it was interesting because it was always uh, in, in uh, jungle. And growing up, the jungle was always a pe uh, uh, um, uh, something that um, I wanted to see. And uh, so um, uh, uh, five years before I met Susie, um, I had been praying, God, if you want me to be married, you'll have to bring her to me because I don't make good choices. But if you want me to be single and serve you, I, I'm, I'm here and it's all for you. So um, uh, five years later, uh, in, an, in small group, uh, she had come to talk about uh, partnering with pastors uh, in uh, Peru. And uh, so she was uh, explaining the program. Uh, but the DVD player wouldn't work, so she had to uh, uh, talk about it uh, herself. I went on my trip in January, which he graciously um, paid for, which was awesome. And then, and I was just kind of like, wow, who's this guy that is willing to do that when he doesn't even know me really, you know? Um, and then in April, he proposed to me. He used the words, um, in shall we? He looked it up for man and woman and put that on the card um, when he proposed, so that was awesome. And then um, we were married in August, and in January, Rick went down. The elders wanted him to check out whether it was a calling from him. I knew I really wanted to go. I was so in love with Peru. They had me go on the very next trip uh, to go down, and it was in Palmichi. And while we were in Palmichi and I was teaching, uh, down there. Um, uh, afterwards, there, um, there was a, a young Shawi man that was down there and he wanted to speak to me. So afterwards, uh, through translation, we started talking. He says, I understand God's discipline, he says. So we had a really good uh, conversation. And then he asked me about my hand, you know, what had happened to my hand. And then he got the whole group uh, around to be able to hear the story. So um, I knew that, uh, that uh, God was calling me to, to speak to the Shawi and, and uh, love on them. We packed up everything and by August we were in Peru. You know, I've always had a heart for missions, but um, I had a, a timeshare in Mexico that uh, I bought many years ago. And 
We go to Mexico pretty regularly every year. Not every year, but almost every year. And during that time, as time went on, the Lord seemed to impress on me that I needed to learn uh, Spanish. In 2014, I had an opportunity to go to Spain with a friend of mine who was interested in starting a, a coffee shop ministry. And it was while I was in that, uh, that trip with him that uh, the Lord really impressed on me that I needed to start actively learning Spanish uh, with eventually the purpose of being involved in some sort of a, a ministry in a Spanish-speaking country. So we were Skyping with Pastor Rick and Pastor Jim one, one Sunday morning and then I shared with them what I felt God was calling me to do, eventually go to a Spanish-speaking country uh, as a missionary. And as I shared that, I could see Rick and Jim beginning to talk to each other, kind of whisper toward each other. And uh, I finished sharing and then Rick said, you know, Doug, we have a ministry in Peru and uh, they speak Spanish there. And he said, uh, we'd like for you to, to pray about going to the conference in uh, January this coming year. And I said, well, yeah, I'd, I'd be open to that. And uh, long story short, the Lord provided the, the funds for me to be able to do that. And it was just, uh, it was just a real blessing uh, to be able to, to meet Rick and Susie and to go with uh, Ron Dalton and uh, Chris Cavari and our team that went on the, in that particular year to San Antonio. And it was during that time, over the next year after that conference, that the Lord really impressed on me that, um, yeah, that's where he wanted me to be in Peru. And so uh, the following year, in 2016, in June, uh, it sold all my, sold my barber shop, sold my prop business property, and rented my house, and, and uh, packed up and, and uh, headed for Peru. During the time I was there, uh, I got involved with a local church there, and uh, I met uh, a young lady there named Blanca. And uh, it was during the time that I was studying in Arequipa that uh, we met and uh, we went out for coffee and, and uh, that one coffee date led to another and another. And, and uh, when it was time for me to leave, we, uh, we had decided that we would like to continue our relationship. So I went to Yurimaguas and uh, we continued to uh, talk on the phone and she came and visited in March and, and it was that time that we were engaged and the following November we were married. I never in my life think that I will be a missionary uh, or live in the jungle. I never be in the jungle before in my life too. So. For me, it's, it's, it's uh, a blessing and also amazing that uh, how the things happened in my life because everything, um, bad or good thing, are a blessing for me because I, I, I learn about these situations, bad or good, and I could understand and I'm understanding how God works in your life and it is a blessing it is amazing blessing because you can realize that God loves you and he always makes the best for you You know, one of the greatest strengths that we have on our team is that there are six indigenous Shawi missionaries who travel the rivers and they take our resources. Many times they take my sermons, sermon outlines uh, that have been translated. Uh, they take them to these pastors in very remote places and the pastors in other areas and they encourage them, they pray with them, uh, they give them resources to support their work, I mean, that is just, that just doesn't happen. Uh, when, when it's just a Western couple or a European couple going, they really are on their own and it takes a much longer process uh, for them to develop that kind of implementation and assimilation. So we've seen this and our six missionaries, uh, Gregorio, Romolo, 
uh, Darwin, uh, Edison, um, Hiro, and uh, Jose Yuma are just, they're just a gift to this ministry. It's just been an honor to be able to be involved with um, working with them, learning with them, learning from them, and being able to share uh, God's Word with them as they, so that they can take the, the main themes of the Bible and, and share that with their own people, and it's, it's been a blessing. The work that has been um, possible through these six missionaries and the love they've received from our Western missionaries is immeasurable. It's immeasurable. There is no possible way to put um, even a number on the impact they've had in the 52,000 Shawi. If this was me or you or somebody else from the West, it'd take us 10 years to get used to the bacteria, to be able to travel the rivers, to know the language, to understand the culture, and we'd still just be getting started. These guys are doing it every day as their people allow them to care for them spiritually because they are Shawi. And Doug continues to expand the horizons and the borders, if you will, of our outreach program in Peru. Mi nombre es Gregorio. Yo soy este anteriormente estaba trabajando como líder de la iglesia, apoyando en las iglesias en mi pueblo Nueva Vida. Pero gracias a Dios hace cuatro años que estoy trabajando como misionero de Iglesia de Gracias. Mi función es este salir a las comunidades y llevar el mensaje de la salvación, la palabra de Dios y también al mismo tiempo las enseñanzas que nos brinda la Iglesia de Gracias acerca de la salvación eterna. El impacto que me trae a mi vida es este desde que comencé a trabajar con la Iglesia de Gracias veo bastante cambio en las en las iglesias entre los chavos porque ellos conocen ahora entienden ahora por medio de cómo nosotros salvamos. Quizás anteriormente los hermanos estaban un poco confundidos, pero ahora ellos ya ven o ya entienden cómo es la salvación. Por medio de cómo, por medio de quién somos salvos. No, estaba muy lejos de Dios y no conocía, crecí en una familia incrédula. Y entonces nadie no me enseñaba acerca de la palabra de Dios. Y me gustaba, yo pensaba que, pensaba más que todo no existía Dios. Pero gracias a Dios es que hubo un tiempo en que Dios me llamó, me, me, me tocó en mi corazón ¿no? yo para poder aceptar a Jesucristo como mi Salvador. Pero aún todavía yo recibía a Cristo en mi vida, ¿no? Pero aún así, pero yo tenía esa duda de acerca de la salvación, porque yo no era perfecto después de bautizar o después de aceptar a Cristo. Porque no era perfecto, siempre me gustaba, y me gustaba hablar mal y también y me iba a la vida. Sí, hay cosas malas, a pesar de que son, soy creyente, ¿no? Pero entonces, poco a poco ya vienen cambiando, como dice su, la enseñanza, ¿no? Es, tiene un proceso para poder. Sí, sí. sí yo soy de verdad ante en mi vida perdida, pero en mi juventud no estoy conforme, pero. Cuando he, he, he edad de 22 años me ha cambiado mi vida, me sentió la verdad en mi corazón, me ha, me ha utilizado la verdad en nuestro Señor Jesucristo. Hasta hoy también estoy apoyando a los hermanos, con mucho animado también, otro en iglesia también. Nuestro Señor Jesucristo ha mandado un único hijo, un único ha mandado para salvar a nosotros. Gracias por él, por él estamos, estamos salvos, ahora somos hijos de Dios. Muchas gracias y primeramente agradecer a Dios que, que Dios ha dado esa visión de Iglesia de Gracias para trabajar con ese tipo de grupos, así como nosotros que somos Xavi. Y también este, agradezco mucho a ellos por sus enseñanzas que nos brinda o que nos enseña a través de tu persona para que nosotros así entender las enseñanzas de la Palabra de Dios y compartir a otro. Entonces para mí es que Dios le bendiga a estos este, hermanos misioneros o ancianos de la Iglesia de Gracias, líderes de la Iglesia de Gracias, que Dios le bendiga confiando en el Señor porque somos uno solo en, en delante de, de todos los ojos de Dios. They have been through so much and made so many sacrifices that I, I don't think many of us could even 
begin to think we could withstand. You know, I know when I go there uh, and I walk through the jungle or I get on a boat ride like we did the last time we were there, again, you, you're kind of like in the Pirates of the Caribbean. You're sort of seeing all this amazing stuff, but you know you're going back. And God willing, you know you're flying home. And you know you can do this without air conditioning or the food that you like or the modern conveniences for a short time. They get sick. They're in danger. I mean, we have had them, some of those missionaries over the years, be bitten by uh, the most deadly spider in the jungle, the banana spider, and be sick. We had one guy that got bit by a venomous snake and he almost died. He, he literally had to go through the torment of a vicious venomous snake bite for three nights alone in the jungle. The sacrifice of being away from their families for sometimes upwards of a month at a time. That's a long time to be without your family. To go village to village and, and because the Shawi are kind and hospitable, most of the time it's no problem, they'll be fed, but you don't know where your next meal is coming from. And yet these six Shawi missionaries make this sacrifice with joy. Man, they're just so joyful and they're so positive and they're such great communicators. That's the joy of the Lord that's their strength. They understand that every time they board that boat or they walk on foot, they might not see their family again. They might not ever get back home. They might get sick. They might be in danger. There's no, you know, fight for life or call an ambulance. I mean, they truly live by faith. And it's a beautiful thing to watch. I uh, sense overall in the Shawi tribe uh, in the past 20, well, really 30 years that I've, that I've been there, see a real growth. And uh, something that we've talked about recently is uh, really seeing them uh, come alive and understand grace and understand that um, what it means to, to uh, be accountable to each other, what it means to share the love of Christ with others, and um, that their church, their doing church is not just about do's and don'ts and having a song and a pass the offering plate and, and a sermon. It's really loving each other and it's about community. And, and we see that uh, when we have these annual conferences, the way they interact with one another, uh, the way they interact with the missionaries that come, and uh, one thing that really struck me uh, just this, this year, when I got there, one of the pastors came up to me. I hadn't even gotten out of the airplane yet. And he like looked through the door at me and said, he had a little notepad in his hand. And he says, what are your prayer requests for the missionary? We wanna pray for you, the missionaries. What are the prayer requests? And I was like, wow, this is amazing. You know, and it really, it really, I really, I, I have seen a huge change in the Shawi tribe. And it's, it's because that there's been so much, um, effort put in there uh, as far as the gospel goes, as far as training, discipling, and then um, actually equipping uh, the national pastors and equipping uh, national missionaries from that tribe. It's just, it's amazing to see. Uh, it used to be when we started going to the Amazon in the late 90s, uh, to this part of Peru, uh, it was very common to see 25, 26 year old men married to 13 and 14 year old women, girls. Uh, that is improving. It has been improving. Uh, they're, not, they're not marrying as early. The women aren't having babies as a whole at 15, 14, which was the average age. However, there's still a lot that goes on in the village that, um, that shouldn't. There's still spousal abuse. The women uh, are neglected. Um, as Wes Porter, who's been on two trips in the last 14 months, would say, you don't see a lot of hand-holding in the jungle. Now, what we have seen with our pastors and our missionaries is that they have become attentive to their wives, attentive to their children. They've become loving and they're showing their affection more uh, externally, which is incredible. I shared with them my struggle as a woman and a mom going through empty nest syndrome. You spend your whole life watching your little tiny children and holding them and caring for them and making sure nothing ever happens to them. And then you look down one day and your hands are empty because they've flown off and, and you did your job. 
but now you've got to figure out what to do with those empty hands. Those ladies teared up and felt even more so disregarded and left behind and trying to find purpose. And it was amazing for them to share that emotional moment and say, God cares for me right where I'm at. He knows where my heart hurts and his word tells me I'm valuable, I have purpose, and I can be a powerhouse in my village to share Christ with the younger mothers now and share my experiences. And that was a, that was a powerful time. It was, they taught me in that moment. It was a, a reminder to me that I had to completely just relinquish the control of, of being able to handle, handle everything. And uh, I had to trust God for, for everything. I had to trust God for um, that every time I washed my hands, I wasn't gonna get some sickness. And I lived in fear of, oh, pl God, please don't let me get what Pastor Rick's talked about in some of his stories. And um, I spent way more time in prayer than I have in a long time, just asking God to give me peace, to help me trust Him in a way I never have before, because you are at a place where there's nothing you can do. There's nothing there that um, that we are used to having here. Learning to lean in and trusting God um, was g really good for me. God definitely grew my faith there. And I prayed a lot to be safe and to stay healthy. And God honored that. And I'm so grateful for that. You know, this trip, just the opportunity to see and be with other believers and see just how earnestly and how far other people will travel just to worship and hear God's word. Um, you know, this was a conference obviously, so a lot of the um, people who had attended were walking from other villages. And, you know, there wasn't any one aha moment where a light bulb went on, but I just had this feeling of peace the entire trip where I just felt like I was just home. I wanted to publicly dedicate myself to, to Christ. And to do that down there, I thought was, it was just a way that I could do it in s such that it was fitting because to go so far from home and have that opportunity to do it with other believers um, in that setting I thought was special because God has brought me and kept calling me from a distance for so long. Of course, there's a lot of the other kids and women that were being baptized down there and um, the whole village came out and it was just a cool time and we're singing, really just praise to our God and uh, I believe it was Pastor Rick and Doug Usher and um, and they just baptized me right there in the water. It was, it, I'll always remember that, that was awesome. It's amazing how even with a language barrier, how the love is there, they can see why we're there. And right before we left, all of the pastors came together and they prayed over Jim, and it was the most powerful prayer I'd ever heard in my life. And it just was, I can't say enough of how I'm so thankful the Lord moved me to go because it was one of our last big trips. But just seeing how he was loved, I was sorry I hadn't gone before because I missed so much. Yeah, this last trip, I had the privilege to lead the youth conference and we had teens from all over um, come into this one village and it was, it was so cool to see how many teenagers came out. But something I noticed is the last few trips I'd gone, um, the teenagers are pretty to themselves. They don't talk a lot. They kind of sit over by themselves. Whereas you'll see the little kids, they're all playing together and having fun and giggling. and. The parents really give the little kids a lot of attention, but 
it kind of feels like once they become a teenager, they're made to, you know, it's time to grow up, it's time to be an adult. And so I think that the teenagers, similar to here, they feel a little lost. They don't really know their place in life. They don't know, you know, what is my purpose? I'm supposed to be an adult, but I'm still a kid. And um, it was so cool this last youth conference to just see them come out of their shells. We played games with them and they were laughing the whole time and smiling. And uh, you could just tell they felt so special. Like we have this for us. It was made for us. and. Um, we're learning what to do with God. We had so many kids come to know Christ during that youth conference and just the grateful attitudes that they had. I think that it's easy here in America to feel like we're entitled to something, that we deserve something um, that we don't really. And I believe that the people down there, they're just super grateful for every single thing that they have. Um, it doesn't matter if it's a t-shirt that they wear every single day of that week they are grateful for it. And it's so cool, you see the older kids share with their younger siblings. So if we hand out gifts or we give them something, um, you don't see the teens run in and grab it for themselves. You see them run in, grab it, and then go give it to their younger sibling. And um, the first time I ever saw that, I it really made me step back and go, do I do that in my own life? Am I, am I that grateful with everything that I have? Because I deserve none of it. Um, God has blessed us with this, and that's something I learned from them. They, they understand that already, and that'll always be a lasting impact on my life. You know, I, I don't know that there, it's necessarily a sense of pride, more as a, a, a sense of gratitude, just to be a part of something like that. Um, you know, I have uh, buddies that, that were on that trip that we still communicate on a, on a weekly basis, daily basis. and. At times, we'll kind of reminisce just how, how grateful we were to be a part of um, these people's lives. And we got to do something that not a whole lot of people get to do. And so I think that when, you, when we look back at it, it's more of a sense of, of thankfulness to the church, to the people of this congregation that, that helped pave the way and, and make it possible for us to be able to do that. Um, so I would say that's, that's really the main thought that crosses my mind when I think about it. I can promise no one has been more impacted by the love of the Shawi people more than I have. Every single time we see each other, we have that connection. It's like, man, we sweat together. We bled together. We took a giant step of faith together. So my life has been completely transformed. It changed my preaching. It helped me measure every word as opposed to every concept. Uh, it changed the way I viewed my wife and my kids. I love them more intensely and more passionately. My life has never been the same and it will never be the same. And that's what really I value above everything else is the relationships, the lessons, and the life change that God has brought into my heart and my family and my life in this church because of the shower. Amazon is our mission, not going to change. We must go back. We have to go back, and we will.
feels like we're in the dead of winter Waiting on something better But am I really gonna hide forever Over and over again I hear your voice in my head Let your light shine, let your light shine